if there's an upcoming expected news event, like, uh, you know, earnings, a fed meeting an election, um, you know, investors recognize this event could increase volatility. So hence the term implied volatility. Um, they buy puts at higher than normal prices. And this is akin to kind of buying hurricane insurance when the hurricane is already headed to your house. Um, the insurance company will obviously charge a lot more premium. Uh, option dealers are the ones collecting this premium and they're accepting this high risk of an adverse reaction for that price. Um, let's say for an example, if you want to take the Biden Trump election, cause it was clear during that event. Um, if you remember right before election day, stores were boarding up their windows, anticipating riots and to hedge that risk, dealers were short, um, underlying stocks in the amount of the Delta of all these added puts that people were buying. Uh, when the event passed and the world didn't blow up, uh, the implied volatility dropped very quickly. People realized that their portfolios are safe relatively. And those people who bought those puts at those inflated prices kind of lost their money. And, you know, but for them, it's insurance. It's kind of something that you wish you don't want to make money on. So, um, but to use kind of that hurricane insurance example, the hurricane kind of turned away. There's not, you know, but now you're stuck with this one year, uh, policy of hurricane with an inflated premium. So this doesn't necessarily mean though, that the dealers won their mission is to not accept risk and to hedge that risk. They sold short a lot of shares, but now that the risk is gone, the, uh, implied volatility comes down. They don't need those shares anymore. And so they have to buy back those shares and the result, this ripping rally that, um, that really kind of baffled market participants. Welcome to excess returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I talk with Jason DiLorenzo of voiceofops.com and the registered investment advisory firm at IPM Funds. We start with Jason on the basics of option investing, defining the first and second order Greek terms and definitions that are used by option investors and some other basics. We then get into how Jason measures over and under fixed environments and what we can learn from that. We introduce a number of visual slides in this episode, so watching this on YouTube might be best and help you get the most out of it. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Jason DiLorenzo. Hey, Jason, thank you very much for joining us today. Hey, Justin, pleasure to meet you. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Uh, today, we're going to talk to you and we're going to do a deep dive into options and their impact on the market, some of the indicators that you look at that can help determine if the market declines or advances are likely to, likely to continue or fade. I think given the declines we've been seeing lately in the market due to a whole host of reasons, and maybe we'll get into some of those, this is a good time to have someone like you on the podcast to help us and our listeners understand the role that options can play in this environment. Um, but before we get into a lot of those details, and I know you have some slides that we're going to look at too, I thought uh, we could briefly just touch on your background a little bit and your experience into getting into the options world. Um, so how, tell us a story about what got you into options to begin with. Well, so I've been doing, I've been trading options since, uh, about 2010, 2009 to, uh, 2010. Um, I could still remember my first options trade where I had a friend who was, uh, a professor, um, for oncology and he told me that this company was going to fail their FDA phase three, uh, PDUFA date. And so I tried to short the equity because at the time, all I knew was long and short equities and they didn't have any shares to borrow yet. They had lots of puts and, uh, it was my first option trade. I never did it before. They suggested, Hey, why don't you buy a put instead? And I said, okay. So, um, time came around and sure enough, the company did not, it was Celsius as a company. They did not get their, um, their approval from the FDA. And I got very excited to open up my account the next day and see the millions that I made. And, uh, I actually lost money. 
and it was, it was kind of a humbling experience. <laughs> it was a humbling experience. I looked at it and I'm like, you know, if they would have received approval, I would have lost all my money, not just some of it. And, uh, so somebody made a lot of money off of this. What, what happened here? And instead of being scared away, I decided to dive in and see what happened. Um, I got, uh, I, I read a bunch of, I read a few books to start. I got, uh, mentored by an ex market maker, um, CBOE. Um, I read, I still read a lot of academic papers and, uh, read a lot of research and trying to figure out what, you know, what these things are and what options are and why, uh, they act the way they do. And so, um, you know, eventually as time went on, I started, you know, learning enough to be profitable, uh, on the aggregate. And I started, um, contributing to a couple of message boards. Somebody would say, you know, from a technical perspective or something, it's one way or another, somebody would comment on how rates or, you know, this equity or this equity is going to go up or down or indexes. And I would chime in usually in reply and start responding with a certain options trade that I would do in order to reflect that, or the options market is saying something differently or something like that. And people started messaging me and asking, you know, oh, how much AUM do you have? <laughs> my answer was, uh, zero. <laughs> like it's, it's just my own money that I trade. I, you know, through a lot of discernment, uh, my wife and I decided to launch ad Deum funds and, uh, and wizard of ops, you know, a subscription service and a, uh, RAA in order to try to service these people that were asking for my help. And, uh, and so that's where we are now. Uh, the company is about three, four years old. Um, I believe we have about five or 6 million in AUM, a bunch of just subscribers and, you know, the company's growing and we're releasing new products and new ideas, uh, very frequently. So that's great. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I, I wanted, you know, our listeners to know that, you know, this isn't someone that just started trading options on Robin Hood last year. I mean, you've been doing this for, uh, over a decade now, and I think that knowledge will likely come through in this, um, this talk today, but let's try to set the stage a little bit, um, and just start at a really high level with the options market. So how big is the options, the equity options market relative to the equity market itself itself? And maybe also a, a second follow-up question is how much has it grown since, um, the pandemic started? So for 2021 total options volume was about 3 billion contracts. Uh, it was the highest yearly volume on record and up, uh, 19% from 2020. That's from, that's according to the CBOE. Um, the total options average daily volume ADV reached a new all time high of 12.1 million contracts traded per day in 2021. So this is a massive, um, it's a massive market. And as you can see in the graphic, it options, notional volume has now exceeded equity notional volume uh, on a monthly basis. Option notional volume has exceeded equity notional volume almost by 40%. And it's been never been higher. Um, it's the same is true, uh, up to today. So it's a lot. Um, also total volume traded through CBOE's retail priority program, which is uh, us equities, individual equities was more than 71 billion shares in 2021, which is up 108% from last year. And it's representing 283 shares in a 283 million shares in average daily volume. And for the year, the total notional vo value traded through it was, sur was surpassed $2.5 trillion, which is up 146% from 2020. So it represents, uh, more than $10 billion in, uh, average daily notional volume. Was the, was the pandemic, the post pandemic period where everybody was stuck at home and a lot more people were trading options is, was that really a turning point in terms of the size of the option market? Do you see like a huge growth coming out of that period? I think there was huge growth, but it wasn't really a turning point because the trajectory was up, uh, all the way up till until 2020. I think the other part of it is, um, I think the other part is that in, in 2020, it definitely lifted off, but there are some equities in particular, stuff like Amazon and Tesla, 
um, Apple, where they're at the time, their equity valuations were extremely high and people were using options in order to have exposure to them without having to pay the $3,000 a share that they were requiring. And that's why, uh, in a lot of cases, we see more option volume in those names than anywhere else. Can you help us understand what happens when an investor actually purchases an options contract and the role that the option dealer plays in the market and how it's different than the equity investor that's buying and selling on an exchange, just the sort of, and the, basically the role that the option dealer plays in these transactions. Yeah, sure. Um, well, of course, I mean, I want to define really quick what an option dealer is. Um, option dealers are basically option market makers. Uh, they're an intermediary in order to facilitate option transactions. Um, that suffix ER, like dealer or market maker, kind of suggests it's a person, but nowadays it's mostly high frequency trading computers uh, that can do these calculations swiftly and accept a lot more options volume than, in, you know, an army of people can. Um, when an equity order is received, just like for a stock to a market maker, the market maker's job is just to match that equity order with a partner and take a small fee for the transaction. It's just a one, a one kind of thing. Uh, but options are a bit more complicated because there's so many expirations and strikes that sometimes finding a partner is much more difficult. Uh, for instance, what if a person's looking for an SPX call at 3,000 two years from now, deep in the money? Um, you know, it's typically called a leap. Um, and there needs to be someone to facilitate that transaction without a partner. Otherwise, they're going to be waiting forever or assuming too much risk. Um, so it's that, that person is the option dealer, uh, like a market maker. They do not want to accept risk. Their job is to collect the little fees and they don't want to take, uh, any sort of risk in their position, whether directional volatility, any of that. Um, and further complicating the matters is that options are a derivative product, which means there are more variables to consider than a strict equity. It's not just the direction of the stock. Uh, there's a price component, but there's also a time component, a carry and interest component and a volatility component that all carry their own risks. So the option dealer has to figure out ways to hedge all of those risks um, the best they can. So in short, to handle the price risk, they buy and sell shares of the underlying uh, and handle volatility and time component either with other options or volatility products. Um, they also increase their fees, the premium fees, in order to hedge their risk as well. So with all that additional option value that we just talked about. They're making a lot more money on the aggregate, but also with their hedging activity, they are heavily influencing the market as well. What type of options do investors mostly buy in the market today? And what position does that typically leave these option dealers in, in terms of their own positioning and hedging? Okay. Well, first I, we need to define what, who, what investors we're talking about and the still to this day, the majority of investors that deal and options are, um, are predominantly like insurance companies, uh, annuity, excuse me, insurance companies, annuity, uh, providers, uh, and they sell products that are designed to guarantee, um, a certain level of returns, but really what they're trying to do is control risk by buying puts and selling calls and on their positions and they charge fees in order to do so. Um, option dealers are also charging, we're also charging very high premiums for these puts because it is one-sided risk that dealers don't want to assume. So that was kind of the first generation of option investors. Most of our viewers are probably familiar with the idea of buying calls or buying puts, but there, there's also a lot of activity on the sell side. I've also noticed that typically you've got a lot of ETFs out there these days. You've got put write ETFs, you've got, you know, call writing ETFs. So can, can you just talk about the other side of that, the idea of writing calls and writing puts, why someone would do that and, and you know, what sort of the risks and returns of that are? Yeah, sure. So after, um, annuity and insurance providers were, you know, kind of inflated the option market, uh, there were several papers, uh, released by the CBOE that showed that writing option contracts kind of being on the side of the market makers, giving, uh, puts to these annuity and insurance providers. Um, 
is very profitable. In fact, the CBOE released an index called the PUT index. You could put that in your ticker on your broker dealer and see, uh, and you could track the returns on that index. You can't trade on it, but it's just a, it's an indicator. And they realized that there was opportunity to sell options to these price agnostic investors. And they began selling puts to capture those high premiums that option dealers were charging. Um, and it, sh they showed to have a very high sharp ratio and, you know, there's a lot of large hedge funds and, uh, and basically groups that, uh, pension funds that in, in employ that strategy quite a bit. Um, but kind of like the annuity sellers, this was an easy strategy to market on a grand scale and capitalize on a certain amount of edge. And you could tell a prospective client that you sell a put at a stock that you would buy at that level anyway, and earn X percent premium instead of collecting interest in a savings account, waiting for the stock to get there. Um, and the same is true with covered calls. You can say that you can collect returns above and beyond your capital gains by selling calls against your current stock position and gain a certain premium. Uh, but what isn't mentioned is the risk regarding those positions. That is you fix your gains and have infinite losses, uh, as a possible risk. So it's that there is danger in it. Um, so, you know, if somebody, if, if a, uh, if a salesperson, uh, an investment advisor tells you that there is limited risk to it, um, I would question that immediately. Before we talk about, um, some of the impact that dealers have on the market, I first wanted to just sort of talk about the basics of option pricing. I, I still have nightmares from my CFA exam about all these the black shoals and the binomial option pricing model. And I think I've ended up getting all those questions wrong, but behind those is some simple factors that you alluded to earlier in terms of what actually drives the price of an option. So can you just talk about each of those major factors and how each one of them affects the price of an option? Yeah, I was mentioning before, uh, how options are a derivative product. And if you remember kind of high school calculus class, derivatives have a principle associated with them called convexity. Um, convexity is the principle that derivatives increase and decrease in value exponentially compared to the curve that they are derived from. So with that backdrop, there were three main inputs into pricing an options contract in the Black Shoals or in all of them. Um, the first is the underlying price itself. So the closer the option strike is to the current strike, the more valuable the option is. Uh, the second is time. The further out in time the option expiration is to the current time, uh, the more valuable that option is because it has more of an opportunity to reach the strike that your option is at. The third is a little bit more opaque. Um, it's a metric called implied volatility or IV. Um, IV measures how much movement is expected by the options traders. And it's, it's a measurement, uh, by essentially the supply and demand of options. Um, if there's high demand and lower supply, the price will be higher, which implicitly states that the market is participants are expecting greater movement in the underlying stock and its unit of measure is an annualized percentage. So you can see movements in, uh, you can see consistent movements in that, uh, metric. So there are other inputs that have smaller effects like interest rates and dividends. Uh, but I promise that I won't dive too far into the weeds and explore those impacts right now. Um, and the, the topic on the topic of implied volatility, what a lot of investors might know that by is this idea of the VIX, right? I mean, that's, that's sort of a measure of implied volatility that's out there in the market that people talk to uh, talk about a lot. Yeah. What the VIX is, is a CBOE indicator. Kind of like when I was talking about the put index before the VIX is its own index. Um, but it's kind of tradable uh, in through futures and, uh, and VIX options, but essentially what VIX does is. It measures the 30 day, uh, implied volatility of the SPX index. Um, something else that's also not tradable, but you can trade options on it. Uh, so it's kind of a nice gauge of that one month period. What are participants expecting options to do or what, what participants are expecting SPX to do. Um, when you see something like a, a war, for instance. Uh, you should see VIX and implied volatility spike because there's a lot of uncertainty and people, uh, get uneasy about what's going to happen to their equities. So they want to hedge, uh, VIX is kind of implicitly a hedging, uh, indicator as well, which gives it that, uh, gives it that reputation to be the fear index. Um, it's not exactly a fear index. It's more like a hedging index. If you're afraid you're selling. 
So, and that's not sure that doesn't show up as much in the VIX, but, uh, but yeah, so VIX is, is an important thing to keep an eye on because it is very closely correlated to the SPX as we'll see soon. So before we get into the impacts of all this in the market, first, I wanted to define some of the key terms, because a lot, if you live in the options world, you hear these terms a lot. And, you know, if you don't, you'll probably hear them on CNBC or something like that. So I think it's first important to just define what they are. Um, so first I want to cover, I think what they call the first order Greeks which are Delta, Theta, and Vega. Um, and so can you define what those are? These are, these are ways to value your option. Um, Delta we'll start with is the sensitivity of the option price to moves in the underlying equity. So its units are always shown as a ratio. So for every $1, the underlying moves, your option gains or loses Delta dollars. Uh, so if, it, if you have a Delta 0.5, for instance, uh, every dollar that that stock moves, you can expect a point, you could expect a 50 cent movement in the value of your option. Um, it'll never be more than one or less than zero. And the real use case of Delta is it informs someone hedging their option position using the underlying stock, like a dealer, how many shares they need to own in order to fully hedge their position. So if there's one short, uh, option, say one short call, which is, you know, say negative. 0.5 Delta, they need to, for every one of those options, for every two of those options, they need to have one share of the underlying. So, uh, Vega is, uh, when option dealers start to make up Greek letters, uh, this big Greek letter is the sensitivity of the option price to changes in implied volatility. So if there's a demand imbalance, how does that affect the price of your particular position. Um, theta is the sensitivity of the price of your option to one day of passing time. Uh, you can also calculate it to smaller units of time, but traditionally on your platforms, you see theta standardized to one day. Okay. That makes sense. And so is the idea with, with theta. So if, if an option is out of the money, as, as time passes, that option is going to get less valuable. Is that right? That's right. And it's gets less valuable. Um, I call it an exponential constant. It gets less, you know, if there's one day passing and there's five days left before the option expires, that one day is more valuable than if there's 30 or 50 days until expiration. So the closer you are to expiration, the more theta and quite frankly, the higher uh, gamma, which we guess we'll talk about soon, um, higher gamma you, you see too. And, and the idea with Vega is, so as implied volatility rises, the price of options rises as well. Is, is that the impact there? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. So basically Vega, you know, we were talking before about IV and how it is showing the demand and supply imbalance of options. Um, Vega is essentially a measure of if this is higher in demand, if this option's higher in demand, say. You know, if there's a war, you know, a war coming and you're trying to, um, you're trying to hedge your portfolio against it, uh, the implied volatility of puts is going to go up. So if you own a put prior to the war, you, even if the, uh, SPX goes green or, you know, it goes up, you may see that you don't lose as much money because more people are trying to hedge with puts. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the second order Greeks and, you know, we, we hear the word gamma a lot more in the, in the wake of the pandemic and, and the downturns we've had that we used to. So can, can you talk about what gamma is? Sure. Gamma is a measure of how sensitive your Delta is to moves in the underlying price. So Delta is your option price. And then gamma is the impact to the Delta. Um, it's a second derivative of Delta. So again, going back to high school calculus, um, to conceptualize this, let's say you have a hundred dollar call option expiring in one day. If the stock is at 95, a $5 move in the stock price will have a much more impact on that options price than if the stock price was at 50. So that Delta is going to change based on what that underlying is, not just the option price. So that's what Gamma is trying to, is trying to measure. The, the last two we're going to talk about it. I learned these through Jem Kersan on, on, on Twitter. Um, you know, and he, he had this whole, you know, these pictures of Vanna White he puts on there and, um, you know, he, he has some really good ways if, if I'd recommend anybody follow who doesn't, because he has some really good ways of teaching these concepts. But so, so what is the concept of Vanna? What does that mean? Yeah. Well, I love James, uh, Twitter posts too. It's, it's also kind of interesting, but you do have to learn a different language when you read them, but, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, Vaughn, uh, we're, so we're digging a bit deeper and we're also expanding our fake Greek alphabet. Um, Vaughn is the sensitivity of Delta of an option to its implied volatility. Um, if we're going to use that same hundred dollar option example above, um, people normally think that a stock would go up or down 1% on any given day, let's say, and collectively they decide that in one day that number is really going up or down 2%. So implied volatility has expanded. Um, but if the underlying price is at 95, it's going to have a large impact on your hundred dollar option. But if the underlying price is 50, that number has to expand to 50% going up or down one day in order for that option to have any impact whatsoever. Um, so they, they would really need the IV to really ramp up actually a hundred percent before anyone is willing to buy a $50 put, let's say, or, you know, an option that's so far out of the money. I want now, now that we've kind of introduced all this, I want to talk about how this impacts investors and how this impacts flows in the markets. And, and I want to do this in maybe two different ways. You know, you talked earlier about how investors primarily are buying puts and selling calls, which puts market makers on the opposite sides of those transactions. So given that positioning, how does that reflect itself in flows on a daily basis that, that impact the market? So this is kind of beginning the crux of the issue. Um, if there's an upcoming expected news event, like, uh, you know, earnings, a fed meeting an election, um, you know, investors recognize this event could increase volatility. So hence the term implied volatility. Um, they buy puts at higher than normal prices. And this is akin to kind of buying hurricane insurance when the hurricane is already headed to your house. Um, the insurance company will obviously charge a lot more premium. Uh, option dealers are the ones collecting this premium and they're accepting this high risk of an adverse reaction for that price. Um, let's say for an example, if you wanna take the Biden Trump election, cause it was clear during that event, um, if you remember, right before election day, stores were boarding up their windows, anticipating riots. And to hedge that risk, dealers were short um, underlying stocks in the amount of the delta of all these added puts that people were buying. Uh, when the event passed and the world didn't blow up, uh, the implied volatility dropped very quickly. People realized that their portfolios are safe, relatively. And those people who bought those puts at those inflated prices kind of lost their money. And, you know, but for them, it's insurance. It's kind of something that you wish you don't want to make money on. So, um, but to use kind of that hurricane insurance example, the hurricane kind of turned away. There's not, you know, but now you're stuck with this one year, uh, policy of hurricane with an inflated premium. So this doesn't necessarily mean though, that the dealers won their mission is to not accept risk. And to hedge that risk, they sold short a lot of shares. But now that the risk is gone, the uh, implied volatility comes down. They don't need those shares anymore. And so they have to buy back those shares. And the result, this ripping rally that, um, that really kind of baffled market participants. Um, if we want to incorporate this into our fake Greek alphabet language, we can say that the short put for positions are positive Vanna. And that is an increase in implied volatility will have a positive effect on Delta and vice versa. Okay. So, to, so to think about this in, in my layman's terms. So as we approach that election, everybody was buying puts and when people buy puts, the dealers then have yeah. to short the stock, right? So that would have a negative impact on the stock market. Is that right so far? Yes. Okay. Yep. So yeah. Dealers are short the puts and that is a positive Delta position. And in, in order to edge a positive Delta position, you have to go short the underlying. Okay. And, and now in most cases, when people panic about these events with their puts, in most cases, they end up being wrong. And so when those events go by and the worst case scenario doesn't play out, that's where we get the other flows, right? So implied volatility falls in the wake of the event and time starts to pass. And so those, those Vana and charm flows go in the other direction and the dealers now have to buy. Is that, is that sort of the right way to think about it? Um, yes. I mean. It, I don't want to necessarily say that the people are wrong because sometimes, you know, the event actually happens or, you know, it's some, there are times in which fed meetings where people are expecting a rate, you know, rise or something like that. And the event actually happens, but because the primary, because these option dealers are such a large, uh, liquidity provider in the market, 
it's mostly their flows that are directing the next move of the market afterward than the participant flows. So that's kind of, it's more that the event is overcome by the liquidity provide, uh, provided by the option dealers. Okay. Yeah. And it feels like to, certain, to some extent, like the degree of this that goes on before the event sometimes can be so large that it almost doesn't matter what happens with the event. Like, even if you get a very, like the, the Trump Biden election, I mean, we technically had a disputed election. So you could argue that was a very bad outcome, but I guess people had hedged so much in advance. It didn't really matter. Exactly. That's exactly right. So I want to move on and talk about cumulative gamma exposure. You know, I, in the, in the wake of the pandemic been following squeeze metrics and he has a, you know, he has this GEX indicator, which is, is a measure of cumulative gamma exposure. So I want you to see if you could maybe talk about this idea of the gamma exposure, like spread across all the option dealers and what that tells us about how they might um, impact the market if certain events happen. Right. So as a really quick reminder, gamma is how much the Delta moves when the price of the underlying stock moves. And it's essentially a measure of how much the option accelerates in price as the stock, as the underlying gets closer to your option strike. Um, what Squeeze and many of us option traders are really attempting to do is to figure out what the gamma position is of the dealers, of the option dealers. And because they are hedging by buying or selling the underlying stock as it relates to their option position, um, we want to determine their collective gamma so that we can determine how much buying and selling they have to do. And with option notional value exceeding that of equity notional value, um, that becomes a very important input to determine what the next moves of the market are or why the market is moving in the way it is. Uh, occasionally on squeezes, uh, on squeeze metrics, jets, or, you know, you'll see something called the gamma flip point. Um, it's really an approximation of when that volatility gets really high. Uh, it's not really a magic, you know, AB switch and really, you know, further study by both squeeze metrics and I have kind of shown that gamma does never really gets negative, but the lower gamma, the lower, the, um, the lower, the dealer gamma position gets on the aggregate, the more volatile the market is because the more they're going to have to hedge in order to reduce their risk. So we're sort of seeing an example of that right now, right? Because I believe we are, I mean, you may say a negative gamma may not be possible. We're certain in a, certainly in a low gamma position right now. Um, so is that exacerbating what we're seeing in the market right now? Yeah. I don't want to say impossible. It's just, it doesn't happen very, very often yet. We are in a negative gamma environment, uh, as we speak right now. Um, yes, once you still, as the market goes down and people are not hedging, I mean, over the past two weeks, people have not hedged as much as sold. People have sold their, their equities instead of hedging. And what happens is that the dealer position, they don't have enough, uh, put, you know, they don't have enough banna in order to support, uh, the market from coming down. And what happens is, is that the market, um, the market kind of has free reign to go from buyers and sellers that are organic. So the, so right now the dealer positioning is very, very low gamma and every little move of the market gives them more risk in order to, you know, they're very close to short gamma. So if not short gamma, so every little move in the market is riskier than uh, what it would be at a high JEX, at a high gamma exposure uh, environment. One of the things I also learned from Jem Kersan was this this idea, he, he was talking about sort of looking at his option models and how much of the flows in the market he could predict. And I thought it was something like 60 or 70%. I'm just wondering like, how much do you think of like the total flows? And this, this may not have to be a question that doesn't have an answer, but in terms of the total flows that go on on a daily basis in the market, do you, do you have a, an idea of like how much of that is driven by these option dealers? Um, uh, it's different on a stock by stock basis. It's not, you know, consistent across every single equity, um, on the SPX index itself, where the most notional value of options are, um, I approximate about 63 to 64% of all moves can be explained by option dealers. Okay. Interesting. So it, so it is, if obviously understanding this is important, this is a very significant part of what's going on in the market. Um, thinking, thinking about the takeaways for your average investor from this. You know, one of the things I've noticed, and this may be wrong or it may be right, is this seems to have, there seems to be this dichotomy in the effect of this. In one way, it seems to be, you know, dampen volatility and make the market less volatile on a day-to-day -day basis. But it also seems to maybe 
in the tails create more volatility. So it seems to be a situation where we can have these years, like I, I don't think last year we had more than maybe a 5% decline in the market. Um, and you know, 2017 was another good example of like a, a year where we really didn't have much volatility at all. I think we set records in terms of low volatility, but then also we have these big explosions where we have more risk in the tails. So, I mean, do you think that's true? Do you think that's sort of the impact of, of these option dealers and the flows are having on the market? Um, I'd say generally, yes, but your assertion can be better measured by the implied volatility of the options because the implied volatility, the higher it is, the less risk that the uh, option dealers are able to uh, assume. So they try to assume it through higher prices. When you were talking about uh, prior, you know, 2015, 16, 17, when there were single digit implied volatilities, there were large ETFs and uh, funds that were selling options. So it created a more balanced demand supply uh, environment. And as such, the S, you know, S and P 500 and pretty much all the stocks in it barely moved. It dampened their volatility um, because a lot of all the hedging couldn't be assumed by applied volatility. It was being assumed by the hedging effect, the hedging efforts of the dealers. Um, so when IV is low, there's not as much also of a banana effect to move the options higher, but when there is a lot of implied volatility, there is more banana to move the options. So over this past year, um, in March, uh, 2020, the COVID drop, there were quite a few option writers funds, not market makers, but, you know, funds that were selling puts, um, got liquidated. And ever since then, we've kind of entered a new I, you know, a new implied volatility regime where it's a bit higher. Um, however, there, because of that, there is a lot of banana to move the option. So we saw a large gain in SPX in, uh, 2021, right? I guess it was like 26% or so. Um, historically, since most puts are bought and most calls are sold, uh, it puts the dealers in a positive banana and gamma position, which is an environment that is characterized by low volatility advance in the markets. Uh, but once those positions change into lower gamma and vanna positions, the volatility will increase because they have to hedge the risk that they already have on their books. And uh, that's why they say markets take the stairs up and the elevator down. It seems like market volatility tends to rise around um, op options expiration and VIX futures expiration dates. Can you talk to why that actually occurs? Uh, yes, uh, but first let me, to clarify your question a little bit, um, the options expiration that you're referring to is the traditional monthly expiration. Uh, that's the third Friday of every month for equities uh, in the morning for indexes and for VIX products and volatility products. It's the third Wednesday um, of every month. And sometimes that there's a little disconnect. Equities sometimes close before uh, or expire before volatility and vice versa. Most of the time volatility expires first. But um but the reason why there's more traditionally more volatility surrounding those dates is because that's when there are more option contracts that are open and the more option contracts that are open, the more hedging there is by market makers. So the hedges that the option dealers have, um, have to be reversed in mass. And so they, you find volatile times, uh, during that third week of the month, typically. Some people out there have talked about due to the, the massive rise of increased use of options that there's some, you know, big risk here and the market could have some major downside event maybe be, because of this is, do you think that's at all a legitimate concern? Is there anything, is there anything that, you know, investors should be very concerned about given the rise of options? Sure. I mean. Option dealers are very calculated in the way they do things. It almost seems impervious from a Delta and, you know, Vega, all those Greeks, bacon real perspective. Um, however, the ticking time bomb that is referenced that I agree with, by the way, um, it surrounds the dealer positioning. Uh, since options are so popular, dealers control so much of the market liquidity. Um, they don't have infinite resources and it will get to a point. Uh, of critical mass eventually where they cannot handle their option book positions. Um, however, these liquidity issues generally coincide with general market liquidity. Um, 
and that market liquidity can kind of be measured by proxy through the VIX or general credit markets. So as a long-term investor, what I'd be looking at is as the VIX and at, at VIX in general, and as interest rates rise, uh, liquidity is reduced and you want to look for both. Uh, you know, a, a VIX occasionally will spike to a number like 80 or 90. That doesn't mean that the market is going to implode completely. Um, but if you see severe credit stress and you see the VIX rising, um, that's when you could start being concerned as a long-term investor. Um, it isn't just hedge funds or banking institutions that will be hurt by liquidity issues. Uh, it's also these option dealers and they have such precise risk controls that are hurt as well. So once they are hurt, they need to unwind their books and all of that combined, uh, can cause a market collapse that, uh, can really rival the great depression or may even make it look like a blip in history. We have to, uh, ho hopefully that, uh, hopefully it doesn't come to that, um, for, for all of our sakes that are uh, there along the market. Um, I wanted to ask you about the thing that brought you to my attention on, on Twitter. Um, which is this idea of over -vixing. So you've looked at the relationship between the returns of the S&P 500 and the VIX over time and, and how those relate to each other and how maybe that relationship when it breaks could maybe produce an opportunity in terms of figuring out where the market's going. So I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about this concept of over, -vix, over -vixing and maybe what the relationship is between the S&P 500 and the VIX historically. Right. Um, as I kind of said before, VIX is more, um, it's a good proxy to measure liquidity rather than just, you know, imply volatility of your specific option. Um, the correlation between the VIX and SPX, the change of SPX, uh, implies that option market makers are the primary source of liquidity in the market. And VIX shoots up when the option market makers on the aggregate are not willing to meet the demand of the put orders that are coming in. Uh, the validity of that concern is measured by the SPX to VIX relationship. So since option market makers um, will identify opportunities at the speed of fiber optic cables, uh, this relationship is very swiftly mean reverting. So as soon as they see that the VIX has shot up way too far uh, in relation to SPX moves, um, they will take advantage very fast. And that's a, that's a condition I call over VIXing, where um, option dealers were charging more for the put and they then fair value. So eventually they will lower their prices and take advantage of the, re the reduction in implied volatility. Um, the opposite of that, which is if VIX does not move in accordance with the SPX, um, that would be a, that's what I call under VIXing. Um, it's also kind of a measure of what the actual organic market activity is. If somebody is buying as opposed to, if somebody's selling their equity as opposed to hedging their, um, their portfolio, you will see that we will be under VIXed as opposed to uh, properly VIXed or over VIXed. What really drove this concept home for me is this idea of, you know, when you see an event that might scare people, the idea of are they hedging or are they selling? And so the idea, right, is that if, if the VIX is going up more than this relationship, that means people are hedging and they're not selling. And, it, and if it's going up less, then that means that's actual selling, which tends to be worse for the market going forward. Is, is that sort of the right way to look at it? Absolutely. And you could also look at it as if VIX goes up, if we over VIX, if VIX goes up more than it should, then this relationship um, dictates, then you could also see that as inflating Vanna support for the whole market. And that just means that all of the uh, option dealers are accepting higher prices for accepting the risk of the opposite direction of this one-sided put buying spree, kind of like what happened, um, you know, right before the Trump Biden, uh, election, you know, there was one side on the put side and it was everybody buying. And so in order to account for that, the option dealers raise the price. So them accepting that risk. So that's kind of, you, you can all, you can. You could see it in multiple ways. You could see it as demand and supply imbalance, um, increased Vanna support, uh, and just ex exorbitant premiums for something that may or may not happen or have as much of an effect on the markets as people think. So that's kind of all three of those, I would say that, um, when cooler heads prevail, the, um, the 
prices will come down for those options and that will give support for a rally. So if, so if we're over VIXed when the market's declining, then the idea is at some point here, we're likely to get a reversal. Um, likely that decline is supposed to reverse itself. So how, what is, how does that work in the case of a rally? So if, if a rally is under VIX, does that mean that rally is not typically likely to last or do I have that wrong? Um, so option dealers are the, are the primary suppliers of options and being that a, there are fewer of them, uh, B they are, you know, they're mostly computers and they're also more savvy than option buyers who are mostly price agnostic. Um, over VIX bounces happen a lot quicker than under VIX, uh, declines or, you know, under VIXed, um, reversals, I guess, um, it tends to take longer for collective option buyers to realize they're paying too much for an option than it does for computers to reevaluate the option pricing. Um, especially when the value of the rest of their portfolio was going up, they, these options are considered hedges for the most part to them. And the option price is just considered a cost of doing business. But it eventually sinks in and the option buyers get a little riskier and decline to buy their hedges. And that's usually when you see the pullback. To, to do it as an example of this, I thought we maybe we would look at what happened in 2020. Because in 2020, we had the VIX going up a lot. We had the market going down a lot. And I'm wondering if maybe, and I think you have a chart to, to go with this, if you could talk about sort of what was happening in this SPX VIX relationship and sort of what it told us about what was going on at the time. Sure. So... March 2020 actually was not as over VIXed as you would think. Um, it was more over VIXed even last November and December uh, 2021. Uh, we were also more over VIXed um, in the, before the Biden and Trump election. Uh, we were more over VIXed during uh, the February 2018 crash, the Volmageddon, as it's called. Um, but during the COVID drop, we had an initial over VIXing. Uh, you could see in this green box, uh, around, uh, I guess that's like March 12th, you saw an initial over VIXing with the market declining. And it was the first sign that you start to think, okay, it's time to buy the dip. Um, but left to its own devices in this green box, the market corrected itself. And the next day, um, as best as it could creating many rallies at relatively speaking, I mean, they were still limit, you know, limit downs and, and then intervening rallies. Um, they were following strongly over VIX days. Um, but going into the bottom, uh, around March 20th, uh, you know, March 20th, there were some option sellers that went insolvent. And so it had created a massive over VIX, um, over VIX condition. And this is kind of going toward the end of the green box on this graphic. Um, and that's when the fed stepped in and provided a lot of liquidity and all of a sudden the option dealers were not the primary um they were pulling liquidity through the whole COVID drop and they were suddenly not the primary uh issuers of liquidity the fed stepped in and so what you saw was a lot of strange uh you know vixing um scenarios where the market was going down a little bit but we were dramatically under vixed uh, because the Fed was injecting that liquidity and it took risk off of the option dealers. Um, we saw spikes up that were also over VIXed. And, you know, something about the VIX is that it incorporates both puts and calls. And so in that rally, you saw a lot of call buying. People realized, oh, the, the Fed is supporting. The Fed is, you know, uh, uh, going to reduce my risk by themselves. So I'm going to try to take the opposite position and buy calls. Um, and it kind of became uh, disjointed a little bit from this whole vixing scenario. But uh, I just kind of wanted to, that that's essentially what happened in this arena during the drop. Um, in that green box, you can pretty much predict what the next day's returns were going to be uh, generally based on this whole vixing, over vixing and under vixing scenario. Um, at the red box, uh, people like me had to step out and kind of, evaluate what the Fed was doing and act appropriately and kind of update my, my thesis based on what they were doing. Just two more questions that I here before we wrap it up. Um, most of our listeners are long-term investors. Um, and what I wanted to ask you was, you know, what do you think that, and you know, you, you guys manage you know, you have a money management firm, you're at an RIA, so you're obviously dealing with 
um, long-term investors too. So what in this discussion that we've talked about is useful or can be incorporated into a long-term investment plan? Or do you think this is really more for short-term, it's more that the information is more valuable for, for shorter term traders? Sure. So the price of a stock is its fundamentals plus its liquidity. Um, and even from the market driven liquidity, um, option dealers are the primary source of equity liquidity right now. And so therefore, if you're fundamentally driven long-term investor, you have to pay attention to that liquidity portion of the price of your positions as well as in the general market. And if there is no change in fundamental thesis, but you can't explain why your stock just increased or declined 20%, it is most likely a liquidity issue. So therefore it's vital, uh, in my opinion, to keep tabs on the option exposure of the equities in your portfolio and try to assess, um, the liquidity that option dealers are providing to you as the investor in these equities. That makes sense. Um, in terms of, uh, we have a standard closing question here. We'd like to ask all of our guests. Um, based on your experience in the markets and the research that you're doing, if you could impart one piece of wisdom or one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? I would say use trading or investing to practice excellence. So, um, Aristotle says excellence is never an accident. It's always the result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. And it represents a wise choice of many alternatives choice, not chance determines your destiny. Um, if you cannot be patient with your trades and your thesis, how can you be patient with your children? Or if you cannot be humble about your theses, how can you be humble with your friends or your wife? Um, if you cannot be disciplined in your trade plans, how do you be disciplined in anything else in life? Um, when you're trading, there are no lies. There's no participation trophies. There's no moral victories. It's just price. And price lets you know exactly where you stand at all times and you must exercise virtue to succeed. So my overall advice is let the markets make you a better person as opposed to dictating your life. That's a great answer. Thank you. If people want to learn more about, uh, your research, your subscription products, your asset management firm, where can they go to find out more? Sure. Um, we have, so first, I mean, you guys heard of me from Twitter and my Twitter handle is at Wizabops. I also have, uh, if you're interested in a subscription service, which is monthly newsletters on option expiration weekend, um, kind of suggesting, uh, suggesting trades, giving good fundamental ideas in the current macro situation. Um, you can go to www.wizofops.com and um, if you're interested in asset management, the RIA firm that we do is, um, www.addamfunds.com. That is A D D E U M F U N D S.com. So, um, yeah, come visit and, uh, shoot us a note and we'd love to have your board. Great. Jason. Thank you so much. Um, we wish you all the best with, uh, all these businesses and. I think that our listeners are going to learn a lot from this discussion. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Justin and Jack. It's a pleasure talking to you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of excess returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practical quant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.